Are we human because we gaze at the stars, or do we gaze at the stars because we're human? If you ask me for my earliest memory regarding the stars, I would tell you this. At the tender age of four, my family and I journeyed to Uluru. I can remember immense detail about the trip, from the Aboriginal artwork at Alice Springs Airport to the, the soft toy koalas I got on the didgeridoo my mum never bought me. But there was one thing which stuck in my mind, and that's that when we went out to see the rock, I found myself staring at not at the rock, but at the sky. Popular scientist Carl Sagan described in his famous Pale Blue Dot speech that astronomy is a humbling and character-building experience. Yet I was four years old before I was able to learn what it was that Sagan was talking about. You see, the term awesome has lost its meaning. We've colloquialized a word that by definition meant indescribable, fearful admiration. If we believe the mind-numbing lyrics of the Warner Brothers Lego Men, then everything is awesome. But a quick glance offers the true meaning of hashtag awesome. Instagram informs us that awesome is a tattooed ankle, a straight flush in poker, or a perfectly manicured salad. But I don't think pop culture allows us to see the reality of all. New Age philosopher Alain de Botton notes the essential relationship between religion and nature as the key sources of awe at the turn of the 20th century. He says, It is no coincidence that the Western attraction to sublime landscapes developed at precisely the moment that traditional beliefs in God began to wane. If we look at the romantic poets like Wordsworth and Hopkins, we see a devout reverence to nature and the awe that it inspires, or so my English teachers would have me believe. This, for example, is The Wind Hover, a poem by Jared Manley Hopkins. It describes a falcon caught in the wind, flying at precisely the speed at which the wind pushes it, thus hovering. And he's musing on it as a creation of God and like the immense uh, just power that he has in creating such beautiful nature. And yet, Hopkins is a perfect example because having been writing in the latter half of the 19th century, he was writing in a time of immense urbanization and industrialization at a time when a nature was slowly starting to deteriorate and people were focusing on material things and he became overcome by depression given that disconnection. Thus it's no surprise that psychologists and philosophers are concerned that so long as agnostic youth are growing up in an urbanized world of cement and street signs their sense of awe will continue to diminish. Let's take a look at a bit of famous Shakespeare. The fault Dear Brutus, is not in our stars, but in ourselves. That's actually the line that inspired The Fault in Our Stars' as title, for you young readers out there. What Shakespeare's saying here is essentially that nothing is predetermined, that there are no stars or spirits that can shape our world, and that it's only us who has that power. But I think such focus on the self rather than the stars has resulted in shallowness and a loss of humility. Even though awe has fascinated scientists for centuries, few psychological studies have been done to explore its parameters. Albert Einstein, who is himself openly agnostic, stated, the most beautiful emotion we can experience is the mysterious. It is the power of all true art and science. He to whom this emotion is a stranger, who can no longer pause to wonder and stand wrapped in awe, is as good as dead. So with this in mind in 2003, two psychology professors, Kelton and Haight, embarked on the first study into awe-inspiring encounters. In short, they deduced two things. Firstly, that awe always involves a feeling of vastness, and secondly, that we can only feel awe when we can expand our understanding of the world to include the awe-inspiring experience. As part of their study, they asked participants to show awe without speaking. Now, at the risk of looking like an emoji, the most common response was an O-shaped mouth, with raised eyebrows and arms out wide. No words were needed to express that moment of still wonder. Yet awe undoubtedly remains something of a puzzle, and not one we can do as we get older, because we additionally must accept we have also been saturated with simulacra in the 21st century, which we're trying to process while living in a world which is predominantly mundane. You see, I can pull out my phone and search Niagara Falls or find photos I've taken of minarets stabbing up from the Istanbul skyline. 
but each photo joins the hundreds of selfies and Snapchats I've got collecting technological dust in my phone's hard drive. I remember the awe inspired within me by the sky over central Australia, yet I can't remember the videos I watched on Facebook yesterday, and I'm sure most of you can't either. Our sense of mystery has been blurred by technology, and it seems that the rare moments of unadulterated awe in my life rest up here in my mind. We can watch black holes collide and see space moving in waves. Uh, congratulations, Mr. Einstein. But we can't traverse these stars. So surely we can find a moment to stand in awe of them and feel small. So is that the best thing we can do with the feeling of awe? Store it somewhere in our head, hoping to bring it back to relieve the mundane temporarily? I think we need to start by letting awe put us in our place. It makes us feel small, and we are small. We are one in seven billion. We need to think like the astronauts who see Sagan's pale blue dot. We are a teeny speck on a teeny planet at the edge of the galaxy in a small corner of the universe. This is the photograph that Sagan was talking about. That there is the pale blue dot, the furthest photo ever taken of the Earth at six billion kilometers from the Voyager space probe. And here's a full version of that quote. It has been said that astronomy is a humbling and character-building experience. There is perhaps no better demonstration of the follies of human conceits than this distant image of our tiny world. To me, it underscores our responsibility to deal more kindly with one another and to preserve and cherish the pale blue dot, the only home we've ever known. Yet these moments of awe and the realizations they bring don't diminish us, but rather enhance us. Asked about the perspective of Earth hanging in space, astronauts most typically explain that they see unity and connection as they witness Earth's community from afar. So while studies suggest moments of awe cause altruism and a desire to share any inspiration felt, I think we need to do more than this. I think we need to cultivate awe. We need to foster these experiences because they make us more human, not less. And how do we foster it? Well, I think we need to remove the divide between nature and culture. We will always feel awe as we stand at the edge of the Grand Canyon, looking out at everything that is unknown. But cultural achievements and human virtue can inspire awe as well, especially if we allow them to. We shouldn't just wait for awe-inspiring moments to occur. We need to go out and find them and consciously allow our minds to bend and open up to the possibility of new perspectives. We need to think like the astronauts, see the opportunity inherent to new experiences and allow ourselves to think differently, see the Earth as a unified whole rather than a sum of broken parts. We can visit places like Jerusalem and see Muslims, Jews, and Christians living side by side in a way that shows us the world can be bigger than our own belief systems. We need to read and listen to the stories of lives of the great men and women who have lived before us so we can open our minds to the awesome achievements which shaped the culture of our world. Take the French author Victor Hugo, for instance. Uh, raise your hand if you've ever heard of him. Now put it down if that's because of Les Mis. Exactly. He achieved a whole lot more, but because of the, the surface level way we treat uh, the people from our past, we often find they can't inspire all within us. Some of the other things Hugo did include um, helping create the Third French Republic, the model of the United States itself. The man is responsible for the abolition of the capital punishment in nations across the world. He was instrumental in the movement to recognize Poland as a nation. If we just take a moment to marvel in the achievements of those in our past, we can broaden our perspectives. I'm sure there are hundreds and thousands of characters from history who were treated just the same as Hugo. We should let words ring in our ears like those of Immanuel Kant. Two things fill the mind with ever new increasing imagination and more awe the more often and steadily we reflect upon them. The starry heavens above me and the moral law within me. So let's not be slaves to the mundane. Let's search for awe. Pick up your ironing board and take it out under the stars. Search the great minds of centuries past in dusty books and forgotten libraries. Uh, pause in museums and uh, look up at Tyrannosaurus rexes and Michelangelo or eat frog sashimi in Tokyo and haggis in Scotland because perhaps we can foster awe by filling our minds and letting it seep to the horizons of our thoughts. There's something Van Gogh said in the months before his death that perfectly concludes all of this. 
He said in a letter to his brother regarding the now famous painting Starry Night, I know nothing with any certainty, but the sight of the stars makes me dream. I think it's that sort of artistic openness to awe that keeps us alert to the deeper sense of what it is to be human as we stand in wonder at the things which will exist long after we have gone. Thank you. Thank you.